First time guests viewing online and physically present. Welcome, we are so glad you're here. Let's give it up for the mighty men and beautiful women of our Correctional Facilities Partnerships in the Carolinas. And to the beautiful TC family, so, so good to see everybody. We are continuing our series, Storm Proof. And the idea, teenagers, is this. Not that we're not going to go through storms, but that the storms are not going to go through and destroy you. That we're going to build our lives on Jesus. And so when the flood rains come, we're standing on him. When the, when, when the wind howls, we're, we're, we're in his refuge of grace. Now, you need to know this. Dark, demonic powers want to derail and destroy you. Let me talk to those of you who are not followers of Jesus yet, and we're so glad you're here. We're so glad you're watching online as well. Uh, we believe that when God created, he created these beings called angels. And there was this beautiful angel named Lucifer who wanted to be God. And somehow, some way, he got a third of the angels to join him in his madness. And those angels became demons. Now, understand as teenagers, God and Satan are not like in an arm wrestling match. And God's like, eh, no, 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 no. That's a whole different category. Satan is limited. God is unlimited. Satan is not all powerful. God is all powerful. Satan is not omnipresent. God is present everywhere. There is no competition. God has won. He rules and he reigns. Satan cannot touch him. But listen, but he can mess with you and me, though. He can mess with you and me, though. And he has a strategy that is as old as the Garden of Eden. Now, here's what's messed up about his strategy is he doesn't come at you with, like, ugliness and horns and stuff. He takes something good and makes it an ultimate good. So, so God himself, teenagers, is the ultimate good. His creation is a secondary good. But what Satan does, he goes, you know what? God's holding out on you. So let's put the creation above the creator. And so he doesn't make it sinister. He makes it enticing. How many people, if they're of sound mind and judgment, would go, man, you know what? Having an affair against my spouse is a great idea, destroy my family, destroy my reputation, dishonor God. Yeah, let's do that. No, no, it doesn't start that way. Greed doesn't start that way. Lying doesn't start that way. It starts with three primary strategies that the dark powers of evil have used and will continue to use. If you're new here at Transformation Church, this may catch you off guard, but just watch what everybody does. The scene of the crime is your? Mind. The scene of the crime is your? Mind. That's where the game is played. The place of trickery can also be your place of victory. So what are these three lies? The dark powers of evil have a strategy to destroy you and I, and here it is. You are what you do. You are what you do. So let's pause here. On the surface, that sounds good. And think about it. For us as Americans, oh my gosh. I mean, we are taught, you, you better graduate high school. You better go to college. You better get a good job. You better move to Ballantyne, get 2.3 kids, put them in an elite private school, have a big old SUV that guzzles gas, and you've made it. Now, once again, nothing wrong with private school, nothing wrong with 2.3 kids, nothing wrong with a big old SUV, nothing wrong with those things unless they become ultimate things. And when they become ultimate things, you begin to be determined by what you do. And so what happens is when we build our lives, teenagers and young adults, on what we do, when we do that, if something gets in the way of that, we have to destroy it. So, for example, say you're at work, and what you do is determined who you are, and the higher you go up in a company, anybody that's going ahead of you is a threat. So what do you got to do? You got to sabotage them. You've got to manipulate them because you're in competition. You got to win. You got to be the best. Or what happens is the two ugly faces of pride. The first is this. If I am what I do, I've got to manipulate, lie, still, and cheat because my reputation is based on what I accomplish. 
and failure is not an option. The other side of it is I got to lie because if people actually know I haven't lived my dreams, I mean, respectfully, some of y'all be lying on Instagram. Ooh, y'all be, oh, look at my perfect life, knowing your life is a wreck. <laughs> but people look, and their lives are a wreck, and they're like, I know you faking, I know. It's kind of like watching reality TV. It is scripted. It's not real, but we watch it because their lives are a worse train wreck than ours. So one side, you have to fake it. The other side, you've got to eliminate because you are what you do. And if someone gets in the way, but it leads to a life of self-centeredness. And self-centeredness always leads to destruction. But the problem with self-centeredness, you're not the only one to get hurt. You hurt the people who are in your sphere of influence. So it starts off good. You are what you do. I mean, who doesn't want to accomplish much? But the problem is trying to do it without God. Good things become ultimate things. And when good things are ultimate things, you distance yourself from the loving Father. Here's his other strategy. You are what others think. You are what others think. Popularity. So, so, so let's have a moment of, of clarity here. How many of us have done things we know we shouldn't have done because we wanted to impress people. We wanted them to like us. Now, let's pause. Having a good reputation is good. I, wanna, I want people to think well of me, but I'm learning that no matter what you do, there's going to be some people who just don't like you. There's going to be some people who just don't like you. No matter how hard you try, no matter what you do, they're not going to like you not going to like me. And so what happens is, is if we live in such a way that we want everybody to like us, we become people pleasers, which means we have no boundaries. And when we have no boundaries, we drown under the weight of that. And then we get mad at the people who are simply doing what we allowed them to do. Here's another thing. Whenever there's an idol and it gets pushed, we have to defend it. So if we want people to think about us a certain way, we have to do certain things to defend and keep up the aspect of who we are. Oh, it's an exhausting way to live. But it's a lot more sinister than that, too. Because if my popularity is based on what others think of me, I've got to guard that, protect that, manipulate that, lie about that. Here's the other one. You are what you have, possessions. You are what you have. If you're not a follower of Jesus, understand this. Having things is not bad, but when those things have you, it could be very bad. You know, and I understand I am in a city full of banks. And for those of you who work at banks, I think it's important for you to listen and live out your faith of following Jesus. But, but, but when possession drives you, you can be too big to fail. Y'all remember 2008 when banks were too big to fail? When banks made the problem, we bailed them out with the tax money of our money. I didn't ask them. They didn't ask me if they could have my tax money to bail them out for stuff. I want somebody to bail me out. Think about it. We get mad trying to, uh, you know, a president wants to pay for kids' college, and it's a problem, but to bail out banks who did unscrupulous things, it's not a problem. It's a problem when they do it. What do you say? It's a problem when I do it. See, y'all know about that. Let me, let me, let me, let me reel it back in. Okay. But think about it. Think about how many people, not there were executives who didn't get a golden parachute and get to go to Tahiti, but there were people who lost their homes. Even Jellicles, we didn't say much about that. We, we say everything about everything else, but don't mess with my greed. Human trafficking is a result of possessions. See, it starts out good. It's, it's nothing wrong. Like, it's nothing wrong with wealth unless the wealth has you. If you're wealthy, please give more than 10%. Like, God didn't give you all that just to go, here's 10%. Jesus didn't just give 10% of his blood. Like the wealthier you get, the more you should give. To make, you can't take it with you. Your, your people's just going to argue about it when you die. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Hey, but seriously though, you are what you possess. And here's another one, this thought just came to me. Moms, this can apply to your kids. This can apply to your kids. Your kids belong to Jesus before they belong to you. Let me say it again. Your children, my children, belong to Jesus before they belong to you. Lead them to Christ, because they're going to find out sooner or later that you and I ain't Jesus. Some of y'all like, but I'm pretty close, Pastor. (laughs) Oh, man. Satan may have a strategy, but God has a better strategy. The scene of the crime is your mind. A place of trickery is where God wants to have victory. But God has a strategy to protect you and stormproof your life. To protect us does not mean we don't go through stuff, but it means that stuff won't destroy us. And teenagers, listen, it is here in your mind. Transformation Church is named after Romans 12, 2. And one, verse one says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercies, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is your act, reasonable act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your feelings. Wait, are you sure? Are you sure? I mean, because I talk to a lot of Christians and they always start with, well, I feel. Wow. Did I just step on, did I, did I, did I just step on your bunions? I stepped on mine too. Be transformed by the way you feel. No, no, our feelings follow our thoughts. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The scene of the crime is your mind, but place of trickery is actually where God wants to have victory. You have the mind of Christ, the truth of Christ, the gospel of Christ, the good news of Christ. So what does God want to do? The way he stormproofs our life is God places you and I in Christ. He places you and I in Christ. Let's do some quick theology here. The word Christian is used three times in the New Testament. Uno, dos, tres. The word disciple, which means a student or apprentice, is used 269 times in the New Testament. The next word that describes a follower of Jesus is in Christ, or Christ is in us, is over 157 times. So we are in Christ people. Those who've trusted Jesus, we are in Christ people people. And this is what this means. Let me, let, me, let me just give you a little preview, okay? Listen up. Jesus is the location where our sins go to be forgiven and forgotten. Jesus is a location where the life we were created for is discovered. Jesus is a location where our old life dies and a new one arises. It is Jesus over everything. If you're new here, we don't teach self-help. God is not your co-pilot. He's not your helper. He's not your butler. He is God. He is life. He gave his life for you to give his life to you, to live his life through you. He don't need your help. He don't need my help. We need his help. Come live in me, Jesus. He wants to do that in us. So listen, for those of you who don't follow Christ, God is not going, okay, I want you to come to me and follow all these rules and be really, really good and don't do sucky things. No, he's he's like, come to me and watch me change you. Because you do know people can do good stuff and not be Christians, right? If you don't know the standard of good. The standard of good is not Gandhi. Gandhi. The standard of good is not Dr. King. The standard of good is not Mother Teresa. There's only one standard of good, the glory of God, and that's King Jesus. And at his feet, we all must bow and say, that's what good looks like. And that good God wants to do good things in us. So God places you and I in Christ. Okay, we're going to do a little Christology here. Don't tell anybody we use big theological words. Um, we're we're, we're going we're we're to do some Christology, and we're going to teach our union life in Christ, what that actually means. And we're going to use Jesus as our template, and we're going to go to the book of Matthew. Teenagers, the book of Matthew was written by Matthew. He's a Jewish guy, and he's given his perspective of Jesus, and watch what happens here. When Jesus was baptized, let's pause here. 
Jesus had no sin to be baptized for. Why was he baptized? Number one, he was baptized to identify with you and I. Number two, he was baptized to show us how to make a covenant with God by going in the water and coming out. I'm going to explain more of what that means. And number three, Jesus was baptized because he is rewriting the story of the nation of Israel. Adam and Eve were to be fruitful and multiply and bless the earth. They failed. So God calls a man by the name of Abram, changed his name to Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the nation of Israel, and God says, your job is to reach the pagans in darkness. But you know what Israel did? They allowed the darkness to invade them. And so God goes, you failed, but I'm going to raise up one, a son of David. I'm going to raise up a Messiah, and his name is Jesus. Now watch this. Israel was in slavery in Egypt. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph had to be refugees in Egypt. Israel crossed the Red Sea and went into the wilderness. Jesus is baptized in the Jordan and goes into the wilderness. There's 12 tribes of Israel. How many apostles did Jesus have? 12. Every one of the temptations we're about to read is Jesus being successful where Israel failed. The one represents the many. Jesus is our representative. Everything that Jesus does, he says to his father, everything I do, put it into their account. Friends, that is unfair. We don't deserve it. That's why it's called grace. When I meet a Christian who's not amazed by grace, I question if they are Christians. Grace is what separates us from everything else. There was one who said, Dad, attribute everything that I've done to them because they could never do it. Back to the baptism. The heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. So that's God the Holy Spirit. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. You have God the Father. So you got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here's an example of the triunity of God. We believe God is tripersonal. Now here's something that's really, really cool, and I need you to take some notes. The words beloved son is a term that God would use for the nation of Israel. So women and men who belong to God, he called them son. Write down Exodus 4.23 and Hosea 11.1. Exodus 4.23, Hosea 11.1, and you'll see the history of this beautiful word. And what this word means is a sense of belovedness and belongedness, and you are mine. Here's another thing. Up to this point, family, Jesus hadn't done anything. And his father goes, I'm pleased with you. All right, hear my heart. This isn't about shame. This is about grace. Moms and dads, would you be more encouraging to your kids? The reason why you're not as encouraging is because you want them to be better than you, and that's idolatry. The goal is not to be better than you. The goal is to be in Christ. Can I say this lovingly, and I'm speaking to the younger me? Who the heck made me the standard anyway? I ain't all that in a bag of chips. So we parent out of, I want you to be better than me, when we should parent out of, I want to help lead you to Christ to be in him. The term belovedness, we are his beloved men, women, we, we are his beloved son. And so what happens is, watch this, for those of you who don't follow Christ, listen to this, this beautiful exchange takes place. We come to an awareness that I need to be forgiven. I'm under God's judgment, but Jesus on the cross took that judgment. He took my condemnation so I could re- receive his acceptance. He took my unrighteousness so I could receive his righteousness, that he forgives me, he loves me, he rose from the dead. I believe in him. And then something amazing happens. We get some new clothes, y'all. Galatians 3, 27 says this, for those who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. So let's do some explaining. Several hundred years before Jesus and during Jesus' time, during Paul's time, 
If you were a tailor and someone brought you clothes and they said, hey, I want you to make me a shirt, it's white, I want you to make it red, you would take the shirt, do the sizes, and then you would immerse it, immerse it or baptizo it in red dye, pull it out, and the shirt that was once white is now red, and you would give it to the person, their white shirt is now red. So when we are baptized spiritually into Christ, not only are our sins forgiven and forgotten, not only is condemnation swept away, but God looks at us and treats us the way he would look and treat Jesus. Oh, y'all ain't picking up what I'm putting down. Friends, that'll save you right there. That'll save your marriage. That'll save your parenting. That'll help you say no to things you should say no to and yes to things you should say yes to. Because when you see what God sees, when God sees you in Christ, he sees his son and treats you the way he treats his son. That's the spiritual baptism. Physical baptism is an outward external picture of what takes place internal and eternally. When you go down into the water, that's plunging into his death, plunging into his blood. When you raise again, you're raised to new life. Case in point, my wedding ring. Been wearing it for 31 years. This ring does not make me married. But when I wear it outside and let everybody know I am married, so step on back, I'm taken. When I wear this ring, it reminds me of my covenantal promises to my wife, to my God first, to my children, and to you. This is a reminder. So when you're baptized, that doesn't save you, but it's a reminder that you have been saved. It reminds you that you conduct yourself in the power of the Spirit. It reminds you you are clothed in Christ. Let me hit you with this. How many of you would willfully go sin if Jesus was standing right next to you? Probably wouldn't. Well, friends, he's standing in you. Wow. Here we go. Check this out. Teenagers, God has a strategy to protect and stormproof you. You are not what you do. You are what Jesus has done. You are not what you do. You are what Jesus has done. I am not what I've done. I am what Jesus has done. Let's look at the text, Matthew 4, verses 1 through 4. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Time out. Didn't God just go, I'm well pleased with you, son. Now go be tempted by the devil. Family, he's rewriting the story of Israel. Temptation is going to come. But the only thing temptation can do is lie to you. You know how people go, the devil made me do it. The devil can't make you do anything. You believe a lie that plants a seed that grows into an action. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. A typical Jewish fast was from sunup to sundown. Jesus was hungry. Now notice when the tempter comes. Then the tempter approached him and said, so he waited until he was tired. The enemy's going to come after you after something great or something real low. He says, if you're the son of God, notice, notice the scene of the crime is your mind. He wanted Jesus to doubt his identity. Friends, that's the same thing the dark powers want to do with you. They want you to doubt that you are the beloved of God. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. In other words, Jesus, Jesus, show off, man. Do it in your power. Hey, Derwin, preach in your power. Hey, Derwin, lead the church in your power. Hey, hey, Derwin, do this in your power. Derwin, do, do. And he's saying the same thing to you. Do your job in your power. Do your school in your power. Do your relationships in your power. There's no power in us. The power is in Christ. Notice what Jesus does here, y'all. He answered him, it is written. Man must not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see what Jesus did? Jesus didn't put on a WWJD bracelet. He didn't put on a purity ring. I'm kind of glad the purity ring, ring thing is going out of style because in all my years of following Christ, I've never seen a purity ring jump off 
a girl or a boy's finger and go, get back. <laughs> Friends, that's superstition. But I know where a superpower is. So if Jesus quoted the word of God, don't you think you and I should as well? Can I talk to the 20-somethings and teenagers? Don't get your theology off TikTok. Don't get your theology off Instagram, Instagram Reels. You can read the Bible. Pick it up. Matter of fact, I want to encourage you, take a week off from social media and watch how addicted you and I are. We'll be like, uh-huh, uh-huh. phone, phone. I mean, my hand be like, Check this out, y'all. We live from the work of another. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. If you're not a follower of Christ right now, you're in Adam. You're under condemnation. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Jesus threw his sinless life for you and me. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Jesus raised from the dead. That's the righteous act. The one stands in place of the many. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. Ooh, but here comes a big butt, and you cannot lie. Satan may want to try to deny, but God loves big butts, and he cannot lie. Whenever you see butt, something big is about to happen. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. Check this out now, y'all. It's totally unfair. It is antithetical to the American way of life, and frankly, to every way of life, to go Someone else did it for me. Listen, Christianity or following Jesus is not pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Who made the cow that you get the leather from? Who gave man the idea to make a boot? We don't live from our own power. We live from the righteous one, Jesus over everything. Jesus over everything. He says, Dad... Everything I've done, give it to them. And the dad goes, that was the plan all along. My question is, is will you receive it? Will I receive it? Yes. You are not what others think. You are who God the Father says you are. Hey, friends, please hear my heart. Please hear my heart. Some of us care way too much about what other people think versus what God thinks. I'm learning more and more and more that that's an issue that I got to continue to give over to Christ Jesus. Okay, here comes a little challenge with a lot of love. I'm going to speak to the men. Some of you men, you are more concerned about what your mom thinks than your wife thinks, and you're having an emotional affair with your mama. It is time to get your mama out your marriage. Mama, that is your son, not your husband. Let that man be a husband to his wife. He is not your savior. Jesus is. No claps this service. <laughs> Last service, they were like, preach, preacher. This service, you're like, well, I don't know what he's talking about. Because I read Genesis. Genesis, Genesis 2.24 does not say, husbands, leave your parents. And it says, say, husbands, keep your mama in the middle of it. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no. He can't save you. Listen, your, your little boy's a man now. He can't save you. He can't. Your little boy can't save you. But a Jewish carpenter named Jesus can. And, and, and men, it's time for you to set a boundary and emotionally protect your wife. I'm speaking from experience. Put a boundary and emotionally protect your wife. One of the greatest things, you are her protector. Not just physically. It's easy to throw hands. The hardest part is emotionally and spiritually. But when you're concerned about what other people think, even those closest to you, we become people pleasers instead of God pleasers. What happens is we have a boundaryless life. Let me show you how ridiculous dark powers of evil are. So Satan took Jesus to the highest point of the Jewish temple. I actually seen this in 2017 when I went to Jerusalem. So watch this. 
Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, notice, he couldn't make Jesus do anything. The scene of the crime is your, the place of victory, uh, of trickery can also be the place of victory. He's trying to get Jesus to doubt who he is. That's where it's at, friends. The dark powers can't do nothing to you but get you to believe stories that are not true. Have you ever just made up a story about someone that isn't true because you filled in a lack of knowledge with your insecurity? Some of y'all are like, nope, never happened to me. <laughs> and they will support you with their hands and you will not strike your foot against the stone. In other words, Jesus, let everybody know who you are. Let everybody know who you are, Jesus. Let me pause here. So, in society, we have cultural imbalances. So, growing up, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, all the way to the 70s. So, my generation was the latchkey kids. Guys, in fifth grade after school, I was scrambling eggs at home. I could take the bus across San Antonio, Texas. We would get on the bike and go to the mall 10 miles away and don't come home till it's dark. Amen. So there was like this total like, listen, you good? Go. And listen to this, y'all. When we needed water, we drank out of a green water hose. Amen. So there's some imbalances, you know? Like if something, if, if something was happening like, hey, you got to deal with it. So we make big adjustments to the other side, like, well, Johnny, are you okay, buddy? Hey, how was your day? Can I do anything for you? Oh, were they mean to you? That teacher, I can't believe that teacher did that. I'm going to go talk to that teacher. And then little Johnny, 26, like, I'm going to go talk to your, job, to your boss, Johnny, at, at work because I know you're the best at your job because you're my son, Johnny. You know some of y'all parents have been calling your adult kids bosses. <laughs> Please stop. <laughs> so what happens is, is we overbalance, and the things that helped us to get, make us tough, we go, I don't want my kid to go through that, and we strip them of that same opportunity. So what happens is, is we live in a culture that says this, everybody wants to be loved, amen. Everybody wants to be seen, amen. Everybody wants to be known, amen. But the problem is, is you're looking for people to give you that instead of Jesus. Listen to me, listen to me. If Jesus loving you is not enough, the world loving you won't be enough. If Jesus knowing you is not enough, the world knowing you is not enough. If Jesus seeing you is not enough, everybody seeing you is not enough. Stop putting divinity upon humanity. Only Jesus can carry that. Listen, guys, hear me. We sabotage relationships because we're asking people to be Jesus. My wife can't be Jesus. Ain't no nail pierce in her wrist. Crown of thorns on her head. Only God can be God. And if you fill your mind with Instagram and all these therapeutic TikTok reels, you're going to be stuck with, why don't you see me? And God's going, are my eyes of love not enough? Okay, y'all ready? All right, hear my heart. Y'all, if something happened to me and somebody come in here in six months, you'll be fine. Listen, the reality is, we replace people really quickly. The point of all this is this. People are people, and Jesus is Jesus. Let him seeing you and loving you and knowing you be enough. And then it gives you the patience to put up with imperfect people like me. <laughs> Look what Jesus did, teenagers. Jesus told him, as it's written, don't test the Lord your God. And all of these are quotes from the book of Deuteronomy where the nation of Israel failed, Jesus succeeded. And he's doing this for us. He wants us to allow him to do this in us. The scene of the crime is your, 
The place of trickery can also be your place of victory. Lastly, you're not your possessions. You are God's possession. Let me show you how ridiculous sin makes you. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you fall down and worship me. So think about how ridiculous Satan is, how dumb sin makes you. Does he think Jesus is like, oh yeah, I didn't create everything and you. So let me get this right, Satan. So you're going to try to get me to worship you by giving me what's already mine. Guys, but listen though, have you ever met someone that they were following hard after Christ and you meet them in a few years and you're going, you don't, you're, what, do you, what do you mean you're not a Christian? What, what do you mean you're not married anymore? What, like, what do you mean? Like, like, what happened? Sin deludes you. It alters reality. But because Jesus knows who he is, he's not going to go for it. When you know who you are, that addiction can't hold you, fam. When you know who you are, you stop feeling sorry for yourself. I had a gentleman tell me just a few days ago who had, who had gone through some sexual addiction, substance abuse addiction. I said, well, what was it? He goes, I stopped blaming other people and stopped being a victim and asked God to heal me. He stopped going, well, they did this to me, they did this to me, they did this to me, they did this to me. And he goes, all I kept doing was making excuses, and I had a very low self-view of myself, so I treated myself the way I felt about myself. But when I began to see who God says I am, I chose to no longer be a victim, but to be victorious in Christ. It's a mindset, the scene of the crime is your mind. The place of victory, the place of trickery can also be your place of... Look what Jesus says. Then Jesus told him, go away, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That's upward, inward, outward. Then the devil left him and angels came and began to serve him. And this is exactly the same way the dark powers are going to come after us. Oh, but we're ready for his strategy. You know why? Because we are in Christ people. We know that we are what Christ has done. We know that we are who God says we are. We know that we are God's possessions. And we can say, get away from me, Satan. We will not bow down anymore. Hear what I'm saying, Transformation Church? We're not going to retreat. We're we're not going to surrender. We're not going to be scared. We are going to take back what belongs to us because the King of glory lives in you. Amen. Lastly, this might be for three of y'all. God is not going to deliver you from a friend. If your addiction is your friend, you're not serious about it. But he'll deliver you from an enemy. Won't be easy, but he'll do it. I want to show you a picture. Uh, you know, I'm going to skip that. I want to show you a picture. Go ahead and go past that one. Thank you. Uh, I want to show you a picture of these younger people. So when you get over 50, you come to the conclusion that you've lived like 14 lives, sometimes simultaneously at the same time. So this is the life when our kids were really small. So this one here, Presley, is 27. Bruh. This one here, Jeremiah, is 23, and then you got these two wide-eyed, happy kids. We have no clue what's coming. We have no clue about the emergency rooms. We have no clue about the difficulties. We're just like, yeah. God was probably like, it's going to be okay, boo-boo. So one of the things that we would do is when the kids were young is we would go into their rooms before bed, and we would pray with them, and we would sing over them, right? And so when Jeremiah was small, we would, we would pray over him and we would sing over him. And for both of our kids, before we left the room, we would always say, I love you. So as Jeremiah began to talk, when we would leave the room after we said, I love you, he would say, whoa, whoa. Like, whoa, whoa, okay. Speaking in tongues, I guess. <laughs> whoa, whoa, I don't know what's going on. And so we'd be, Vicky and I began to talk about it and we were like, oh, what Jeremiah is saying is, 
I love you. Friends, when we slow down and remember we are not what we do, what Christ has done. We are not what others think. We are what God says. We are not what we possess. We're God's possession. When we turn down the noise, turn off the social media, we can hear God going, whoa, whoa. The cross is God saying, I love you. The resurrection is God saying, I love you. Now listen, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I plead with you. I beg you to say yes to Jesus. It'll be the best decision you have ever made. You will go from death to life, condemnation to acceptance. A whole new power and forgiveness is available to you. Jesus is saying, whoa, whoa, I love you. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. In this moment right now, I want to speak to those who are saying, Pastor, I, I know I'm not a Christian. I know I'm not a follower of Jesus, but I want to be one. I want to talk to those of you who are saying, hey, I, I'm not sure I'm a follower of Jesus, but I want to be one. I want to pray for those of you who are saying, Preacher, just tell me what I need to do to follow Jesus. The Bible's clear. It says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead, you will be saved. You will be rescued. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That life begins now. A life of love, forgiveness. The life of another becomes yours. Right now, this is your moment. Listen, today is your day. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. Right here, right now, come to Jesus. Come home to the one who loves you. Come to Jesus. In the silence of your heart, say this. Today, King Jesus, I bow my knee to you. Lord, I repent and turn from the things that I've done that I know that don't honor you, and I turn to your grace and your mercy. I believe that on that bloody, rugged cross, you took my place to give me grace. Your blood forgives and makes me right. When you rose again on the third day, you came to live in me and through me for all time and eternity. I am now part of your family. I am the beloved. I choose to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen.